Um, please ask questions. Oh, who has a clicker? Raise your hand if you have a clicker. Okay, put the clicker in the air. All right, now pass the clicker to your neighbor. <laughs> Do we know clickers? Okay, not, not today. All right, so, so um, I wanted to, uh, I'm just giving you a tutorial, and Lisa is going to speak next, we're going to actually tell you a lot more about topology, but you know, I'm going to ask the question, what is topology? Okay, and you know, apropos, or you know, just like Tim Slick did yesterday, all right, vote now, okay? Or B. Okay, what is topology? What do we mean by that? Why is it useful for liquid crystals? And Carl showed you these pictures. He said, well, you know what a disclamation is. Does it matter? Does it matter? Who's like this? There's some beautiful mathematics behind it, and it makes everything very precise. So, you know, this whole story of what is topology. By the way, they don't usually have chalk here. So, um, let me wait. Tim got it for me. So, so here. You know what they say? This. What I just did, you know what this is, a torus? This is the most useful thing to come out of string theory. Because I, everybody knows how to draw a torus now. So, so here's a torus, and people say, oh, the torus, and, and a coffee cup, right? Let me see if I can draw a coffee cup. Because I practice this all day, right? I'm drawing a coffee cup. Oh, this is a coffee cup. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, it's, it's England, it's a teacup. Okay, and so here is this teacup, or right, this candle, it's a funny place. Okay, so, and you say, oh, you see the same thing because they're the same, because <clears throat> topology is about how a torus is like a teacup, right? Or a coffee cup. And the answer is, well, you can get a donut and a coffee, you know, at Dunkin' Donuts, right? Or Mitchell's, or any other places. In the U.S., I'm sure there are donut shops. Other places in New York, you can get a bagel and a coffee, right? That's not why they're the same, all right? So, the thing that's really important, all right, I hope you can see this. If you can, I'll write louder, all right? So you can tell me that. The thing that's important is that, that I can take this, this, this donut and imagine it were made of clay, and I can squish the donut and distort the donut into this coffee cup, and you have this idea there's a handle or something. But the thing that's really important is if I tie a red string around the donut here, and went around the donut once, well, I can mush the donut to the coffee cup without ever tearing the string or taking it off. And if this red string went around five times, it's a terrible piece of chalk. Okay, try a different chalk. It's chalk for a different board, right? If it wrapped around here five times, I can wrap around here five times, right? And I can distort, I can squish the donut into the coffee cup without ever tearing the string. And it would always be wrapping around five times, all the way through. And of course, a torus has another thing I can wrap around on the inside. That's like your inner tube on a bicycle. That's the inside, right? And that would be the inside of the coffee cup, too, going on the inside of the handle. Remember, I think of a torus and a coffee cup as a two-dimensional object. The torus is just the surface. Forget about the insides, okay? Or forget about the outsides. So topology is how these things are equivalent, okay? And... <clears throat> Let me say, what's that have to do with liquid crystals? Okay, because, oh, good luck with that. I know, I tried, I tried to have the whole thing removed. And they, they didn't move. Yeah, you just move it. No, no, no. You're sitting low down. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, hey, sorry. It's blue. It's a cat. Right. All right, so, 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 here you go. All right, so, why does this have to do anything with liquid crystals? Well, the idea in topology is, how can you transform from one thing to another thing smoothly, smoothly, continuously? And the thing about it is that smooth changes here, I'm going to start, smooth changes don't change topology. And of course, I'm not a mathematician, and so I'm not going to define what I mean by smooth. But what I'm going to say is, dynamics is smooth, right? Whenever you do dynamics in a physical system, you know they have these differential equations, there's a time derivative, things move along nice and smoothly, right? You agree? I'm not going to ask you questions, okay? You agree, right? I mean, you know, it's all smooth. It's differential equations that govern everything. You're going to hear, you know, weeks and weeks about differential equations. 
Okay? And the thing is, it's smooth, everything changes smoothly when you do dynamics. So if I have a system that has some interesting topology, whatever that means, right, the topology won't change because topology is invariant under smooth changes. And if I have something like a topological defect, then that won't change under smooth deformations, which means it won't change under time, and it won't change as the system evolves. So that's why it's interesting. It's like these objects, which we're about to talk about, which Carl showed you pictures of, those objects are somehow stable things. And they don't disappear or appear from nowhere as long as everything's going along smoothly. Obviously, if you kick the system, right, something might bad happen, or if you put your finger in it or something. But if it just evolves smoothly, nothing changes. So, okay, that's the first thing. Okay? So, what I like to do is I like to give you a starting example. And there are these symbols, pi sub 1. Okay? By the way, does anyone know what pi sub 1 means? Raise your hand if you know what pi sub 1 means. Nothing. Just a few people. Okay, about pi upper 1. Anybody? It's 3.14151. <laughs> We're going to have pi sub 2. And we're going to have pi squared. Okay, in the US, well, I guess everywhere, almost pi squared is 9.8 meters per second squared. Right? You guys all remember that? More or less. Okay. So, we're going to talk about pi 1, and I'm going to define it by talking about your internal clock. Okay? So you have two clocks. You have the clock that is actually going, and you have the clock of how you feel things are going. Okay? And you know, this, is, this comes up in research, in your life. All right, so here's the clock. This is, this is, the, this is, the, this is the actual clock. The option, what you call calendar. And this is the calendar in your head. Alright, and you notice I drew it as a circle. I'll imagine that we'll talk about, let's say it's a week. Alright, so I'm going to say, I'm going to start here, right, and I'm, it's a clock. I'm going to have a very special clock. It's not that special, it's a seven day clock. It takes seven days to go all the way around. Okay, that's uh, 188 hours. Okay, goes around. Yeah. So, everyone get it? The clock starts going, right? The seventh of the way that today, this is Sunday, and it's a Monday, and Tuesday, and so forth. It's not, I didn't space it right. Okay, but you know, we'll go around like that. Everyone get this clock? This is the clock, it's ticking, all right? But here's the clock in your head, okay? You wake up Sunday morning, you do whatever you do, and then let's, let's see what happens, okay? What I'm going to do, I'm going to try to do it with two hands, all right, is the day progresses here. And as the day progresses here, uh, stuff happens, all right? So it actually becomes Monday, and I didn't get anything done. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't actually make it to a whole day, okay? And, 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 and in fact, let's do this clock, because that's more realistic. Let's have this calendar. This is only one day, okay? This is one day. So if you're a normal, if you're a normal, if you're like a, if you're, you know, if you're a, a robot or if you work on an assembly line or something, then when you go around this day once, how many times do you go around this day? One. No, oh, this is a day. That's a week. Seven. Seven. This is the week calendar. Week. This is the day calendar. Okay. So you go around one day. All right. You go around seven days if you're normal. But that's not exactly how you experience the world. Okay, Sunday I got nothing done. Okay? So I didn't even, all right, I didn't even make it a whole day. All right? All right? I'm already here, but I didn't get anything done. Monday I got a lot done. I woke up early. Okay? So I go from here's, here's Monday, here's Tuesday. All right? As I go from Monday to Tuesday, I actually make a lot of progress. Whoop. I got two whole days of work done. Okay? Then Tuesday, I have a meeting. Okay? <clears throat> Either, you know, if you're faculty, it's a meeting with other faculty. If it's a student, it's a meeting with other faculty. Anyhow, that sets you back. All right? <laughs> you don't always have to go forward. It's like I, I've got two days ahead, now I'm a day behind. Okay? Something happened. All right? The point is, is that by the time you go around one week, let's hope that you make it at least one day. It's possible that you go around this day seven times. It's possible that you're especially productive that week and you go around 28 times. 
right? Each day you die, for four days of work. It's also possible that this whole week was spent and you set you back three days, okay? And that happens, you know, like if something happens with the DMV, who knows what the DMV means? You know, the Department of Motor Vehicles, something's wrong with your driver's license, your visa's wrong, okay? Something happens, it sets you back. You, you actually, in the course of a week, you've regressed three days or four days or five days, okay? Sometimes, sometimes it's like you see a movie, right? And it, like, it makes you dumb. <laughs> but the idea here is that you take a path here on the actual calendar and you go around here and you, you're counting a path and you see once I've gone around seven days in a week, that's it. And you can make a decision between six days and five days and four days and seven days and 22 days. And the rate at which I go around this thing, the day clock, doesn't even have to be uniform. This clock just ticks away. Tick, 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 tick right? One second per second. Sometimes it can go really slowly. I don't get very much done on Sunday. It can go very fast on a very productive day. I don't have to go around this one at a uniform rate. I can even go backwards, right? And I can go faster or slower. Everyone get it? You say get it. I'll say get it. You say got it. Full practice. Okay, get it? No. Okay, good. So, what's this have to do with the look of Christmas? Well, you already saw the pictures. In fact, everybody showed you this picture. What you do in Liquid Crystal is white chalk. Okay, excuse me, what was the DMV? Sorry? DMV. The DMV, Department of Motor Vehicles. You're trying to get a new driver's license or a license plate for your car. I say it most give it. No, no, when you go there, often it sets you back, right? You go in January and you come, you go in June and you come back out. In May. Same <laughs> okay. I mean, in terms of actual progress, okay? Thank you. So, so, what do you do with a little crystal? Remember, so by now you've seen this picture, you know, 5,000 times, okay? So, you have these uh, plates, they're polarizers, here's a polarizer like this, here's another polarizer like this called the analyzer, but it's also a polarizer. So you have two cross polarizers, okay? Your optics guys. What happens when we send light through cross polarizers? What? Zero. Attenuation. Black. What do you see on the other side? Nothing. Nothing. You don't see nothing. You see black. Okay. So you see black. <laughs> but suppose you put something in between that has a dielectric constant. If it's a dielectric constant, nothing happens. But if it's a dielectric tensor, it can get interesting. Because now the polarized light hits the dielectric tensor, okay, or this dielectric object. It hits the dielectric object and it decomposes the light into the, along the axis and some other axis, right? There's different axes, they have different dielectric constants. You get the ordinary wave and the extraordinary wave, the whole thing goes through. And then once you get on the other side, it doesn't recombine and cancel because the two waves are in a phase now because they move at different phase velocities, and something comes out. Yes? <clears throat> so what do you see? What you see is typically, when you see the experiments, you see these points, like this, right, these brushes, like so, and you have this bigger piece of chalk to do this.
Watch. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around this circle. Okay? And now I'm going to measure on this circle. Alright, instead of going clockwise over counterclockwise, because that's how we do things in physics. Okay? So, I'm going to go counterclockwise. I'm going to go around this circle. And what I'm going to try to do is figure out how many times does the director go around? In other words, there's this axis, the director. How many times does the director go around as I go around here? One. What? Does somebody make a noise? Two pi. Two pi. Or it could be minus two pi. You don't know? Oh, yes. Pi. Yes. So you, you get it? Why two pi? Because it goes through the polarizer once, and the analyzer once, and the polarizer once, and the analyzer once. So it goes. It goes, zhu, 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 rotates by 2 pi, but it could go backwards. It would still give me 4 brushes. 4 brushes. But the point is, is I can count 4 brushes. Now, I don't care whether this brush is here, or this brush is here. Right? All I care about is that I went through 4 brushes. And you can put in your head that to get from, say, here's the polarizing direction, P, here's A. You get from the polarizer direction to the analyzer direction to the polarizer direction to the analyzer direction. The molecule has to start pointing like that. Hey, look, it's a circle. See, I only have to care about its, its direction. I don't care about its length or its orientation. All I care about is which way it's pointing. So it goes in the polarized direction, maybe it goes slowly, and then it goes zoop in the analyzer direction, and then it goes fast through here. Like I don't care how quickly it goes around. I don't care whether these dark lines are bunched up or perfectly spread out in a perfect cross. Once I know that there are four brushes, I know it goes around two pi, or maybe minus two pi. Yes? Get it? Got it. Got it? Got it. Got it. Right. You got trained with the push buttons, okay? So now, all right? So you go around. You go around two pi or possibly minus two pi. If I had six brushes, What's the answer? No. What? What? Three pi. Three pi, or maybe minus three pi. Is six brushes allowed? No. Who said no? Okay, why? Why? Yeah. Nobody will tell me. Sorry? Nobody will tell me. No, no, you do observe it. No, I need a six brush. Yeah, yeah, people observe it. All the rest of it. She's even yeah, on premises. I mean, you know, he's in this town. Those are minus three. Okay, I didn't say plus or minus. Three pi. How about plain pi? Can you get one where it's just plain pi? Yeah. Yes or no? Why? And what's that? Why can you get that? Because it'll be lined up the same direction when you get back to where you started. Because the molecule is the same whether you flip it up or down, right? Right. So look at that. Just looking at this stupid picture under this cross polarizer, the very fact that there exists these nodes where there's only two brushes already tells you that the pneumatic has up down symmetry. I'm looking at a picture like microns big, millimeter big picture, mic many micron picture of nanometer size of molecules, right? I'm getting this information with just cross polarizers. See, but that's a topological fact. That's telling me that this and this are the same. So just that simple thing is already giving me information about the molecules. But what's this have to do with this thing I call by one? I have my sample here. Here's my sample. I have some point, that special point. You notice that at this point where the four brushes meet, the molecule doesn't know which way to point. Is it along the polarized direction, the analyzer direction, the polarized direction, or somewhere in between? Because they all meet at this point. So here's my sample. Here's this funny point, which I'll call a defect, which you should call a defect, too. I take a path around the defect, and that gives me a path I need to erase it. Aha, no erasers. That's very clever. That's great. Okay. That was very effective. Okay. So here's the sample. And here is I can call it all sorts of things. I'm just calling it the circle. Okay? The circle of pneumatic direction. And so I have this circle here, and the point is, as I go around the sample, this path once, I go around this circle. This is the pneumatic direction, right? I start with the direct pneumatic in some direction, I can go all the way around, like 
So I can go around twice. If I went around twice, it has eight brushes. <coughs> if I went around twice, it would go through the polarizer twice, four times, and the analyzer four times. Yes? <coughs> no? No, it's just a whole, whole process. Sorry? No. <coughs> if it goes around this twice, it goes, I'll have four. Right? I could go around, because we know this funky thing about the mat, I could go around halfway, and that counts. That counts as one time around. So maybe what you're saying is, we should be more clever and say, this path, even though it looks like a circle, is only half of a circle. Right? This only going around from zero to pi bar would do that. So everybody get it? I count this, this thing here, and it gives me something here. And if I go around this time once, it can go around this minus one times, minus two times, plus three times. All right, there are these half defects. It can go around half, which is a little funky. But there you go. So why is that interesting? Because it tells me that there's an integer. Remember that integer about how many times you wrap the string around the donut? That root. So see, it's the same thing. I go around this once, and it goes around the donut 18 times. 22 times, minus 6 times. Okay? And because of that, this is an integer. It can't go around 6 fifths times. Why not? Because it's not the same as it was before. Exactly, because when I get back to here, the molecule has to be pointing in the same direction. So I can't go around 6 fifths times. Apparently I can go 3 times times, right? Because of the funny things in the molecule. But let's ignore that for a second. It's not important. I know it six times, but I can't go around some funny fraction. Six fifths doesn't work. Seven fifths of it does not work. So it's an integer associated with how many times I go around. Now, let me do dynamics on the system. The system evolves. You don't do anything nasty to it. You don't stick your finger in it. It evolves over time. So what do you know? It evolves continuously, right? You agree? All right, you have this integer. It's like seven. Good. Okay. So give me, give me, a, give me an example of uh, a function, which is an integer, because I counted it, which uh, changes continuously. Uh, X. X, no, 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 it's an integer. Oh, it's an the function is seven. We counted seven. Now yeah. seven changes continuously to another integer. What other integer can it change to and also be continuous? What? In fact, that's the only integer it can change to continuously. To get from seven to six, it can't be six, it can't be six and a quarter. That doesn't count. You can never be six and a quarter. It's not like you're allowed to sometimes be six and a quarter. You're never allowed to be six and a quarter. That would be like cutting that little piece of string and you know changing it around. I don't want to cut the string on the handle. So what's neat about topology is that if I count this thing. I get an integer and it doesn't change under continuous deformation. So under dynamics, that integer stays the same. The topological defect, which is in the center, remains a topological defect with precisely the same winding, or some people say charge. Isn't that cool? So that's all topology is. It's integers that change continuously. The only integers that change continuously are constant integers. So that's neat. There's a name for this, which is Pi 1, I'm going to tell you the name, Pi 1 of S1. So Pi 1 means, this means, a map that starts on the circle. This is the name of the symbol for the circle. I don't know why it's S. Oh, I know why, because S2 is the sphere. So the one-dimensional sphere, I guess, of the circle. Okay, I don't know why. Right? So what this is telling me, Pi 1 of S1, is telling me about maps, or functions. Functions and maps. Probably there's some difference, but I don't know what they are. It's a function that goes from the circle to the circle. Periodic on this, and periodic on that. All right, and then you can say, what are the class of maps? All right, what kind of maps are there? You notice that if I go around this, if I go around this path quickly or slowly, as long as I go around seven times by the time I'm done, I can go around uniformly, a day a day. I can go three days on Sunday, and you know, minus two days on Monday, and then go forward. As long as I get around seven times, that all, that's all that matters, because that total counts. So I don't even care 
about different functions. I don't care about different ways of going around. All I care about is how many times I went around. And that classifies the functions. There are the functions that go around seven times. They can do this as they're going around. They can go this. You know, they can go backwards and forwards. They can do all sorts of funky things. But if they go around seven times, I can't, without tearing them, somehow make a function that goes around six times. So I can classify them by that. And that classification is exactly what this object is. This tells me about the types of maps. <coughs> now, the thing about it is it's a group. And I'm going to tell you what a group is. The group has three things about it. You'll like this. I hope you'll like this. So, what is a group? So a group is a set of things with three properties. Okay? Three properties. Property one is there's an identity element. There's, well, I guess there's a multiplication of the elements. You need to be able to multiply them or add them, whatever you want to call it. You need to be able to add the elements together. So this is how I'm going to add the paths together. All right? If you give me one path, the path that goes around six times, and another path, the path that goes around four times, the way I'm going to add them together is, on the first half of this path, I'm going to, I'm going to go all the way around the six paths that you gave me to begin with. Does that make sense? Now the second half, right, this is me walking around in the sample. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, when I go from here to here, I'm going to use Paul's map. Whatever Paul told me to do, when I go all the way around, I'm going to do it twice as fast. I'm going to do it by the time I get here. Okay? And then, whatever Yvonne gave me to do, I'll do that from here to here. And what will, what will happen here? If Paul said go around six times and Yvonne said go around minus three times, when I'm all done, I'll go around three times. So I can add the maps together. That's all it is. That's the addition. What do you multiply? I can call that multiply if I like. That multiply, I just mean it's something that takes two things and gives me one thing. Okay? That's just a math thing. Okay? <laughs> two, there has to be an identity. Well, the identity is easy. Stand still. The identity is don't do anything. Alright? Stay at the same place. Stay on Sunday all week. Alright? Sounds okay. Alright? <laughs> okay? So the identity is to stay still. The third thing that a group has to have is every element has to have an inverse. You have to be able to undo it. All right? Well, how do you undo going around six times? Anybody? Negative six. Negative six times. You know, you know who can do this? This is to, it gives you a sense of how topology works. Dogs do this. Okay? Dogs do this. You, you tie them to a tree. Right? <laughs> right? right? And, they, go, and they, they figure out eventually, right? They go back to the cats, not so much. Cats, if you do it, they just stop. But dogs, dogs, dogs. <laughs> so dogs, right, it's, it's, there's an inverse. Okay? So you have this nice way of having an inverse. So, so far, we've only talked about maps from circles to circles. What about other kinds of maps? In particular, what about real crystals? So, let's see, I have like 21 minutes. Excellent. Okay. So, here's a good one. Suppose instead of a two-dimensional pneumatic in a thin film, suppose I have a three-dimensional pneumatic. Okay. So I have to be careful what I mean by that. Right? A three-dimensional pneumatic. What do I mean by three-dimensional? Do I mean that the vector or the director lives in three dimensions? Because up until now, I was always thinking of the director as living in the plane. Or do I mean that the space is three-dimensional? Or do I mean both? I could mean either one. Agreed? Okay. So let's start with the one where, what does the three mean, right? Okay, what does the three mean? When I say, what's three? So for a second, okay, let's do the following thing. Let's think about... A, three a flat surface, but the molecules that live on the surface don't have to lie on the surface. 
Okay? They're actually, it's a surface of a, it's a surface of a handle body, it's, it's a surface of a, of a sphere. You have these molecules, these liquid crystal molecules, and they don't have to be in the surface. They actually take values in three dimensions. So how do you describe a director or a vector that lives in three dimensions? How do you describe it? It's a unit vector, because I don't care about how long it is. But it's a unit vector. Okay, so describe the space of all unit vectors. Oh, so you get the basis vectors. What's the space of all unit vectors? Give me, give me the set of all unit vectors. Can you draw it? Here's the space of all three-dimensional unit vectors. Three-dimensional unit vectors. You ready for this? Look, here we go. unit sphere. Every point on the unit sphere is a three-dimensional unit vector. And all the three-dimensional unit vectors are on the unit sphere. So it's one to one. Okay, that's everything. So now, if these things get to live, so what I'm saying is that I have a two-dimensional thing, and at each point on the two-dimensional thing, I don't have something that's an angle, like what day of the week it is or what hour it is. I actually have something which is a vector point on the unit sphere. You know, I have I have Oregon, and then I have I have Ecuador, okay, down here I have uh, uh, McMurdo Base in Antarctica. Right? I can name them. I can name the directions. I can name them with theta and phi. I can name them by whatever you know, um, random Dowling calls them. But I can name them. Okay. So each point here has a, a value there. So now I can do exactly the same thing. Suppose I. Now I'm looking down from the top. There's, I do now a path here. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around this path in the sample. All right, I'm going to say, can something interesting happen? The path in the sample leads to a path on the unit sphere. Does everyone get it? All right, I go around here, and then each point here is a particular point on the unit sphere, so it's a path here. Okay, can anything interesting happen? Why not? Because of number two. No. And that was very, that was uncalled for. Number two. Okay. <laughs> Go on. It's a point. Who said that? I said. What do you mean it's a point? <laughs> <laughs> uh, good. So what he's saying is, when you go around this path, okay, the thing is, is that if I go around this path here, all right, there's a closed path here. But I can now smooth it. And suppose there were a number. Suppose I counted eight. I don't even know what I'm counting, but suppose there were eight. Okay? I can take this path and I can shrink it. And I can shrink it still. So in other words, I'm continuously deforming the map. I'm going around slower or faster, just like we talked about. And eventually I can just get to this point here where I get in the middle. And now you can see that every point here Maps the same point here, a point. And of course, you can't wind around. The point stays constant. They're all the identity. They're all number two. Okay? <laughs> so they're all the identity. This is, anyone know what this is called? What the crystal people call it? Even though it was invented, you know, 300 years ago? Escape into the third dimension. Okay? Because what they imagine is, is that you have a sphere here. Okay? And they somehow believe that this path here goes exactly around the equator. In other words, you could have imagined that as I go around here, I go around the equator of this sphere 47 times. Okay? But so what? I can slip this thing, this string right off the top. I can shrink this string to a point. And as I'm doing that, here I had a situation where the director went around like this. And now I'm slowly making it go like this. That's the next step. That's, that's step one. Now I'm dizzy. Um, I'm going to tilt it up more. And I'm taking the director and I'm just letting it escape straight up. And that's escape into the third dimension. That's why there's nothing interesting. So guess what we get to write? We get to write pi 1 of S2 is 0. There's nothing there. There's only the identity. That's kind of bad. Who cares? But it turns out that 
Pneumatically, the crystals are more interesting. Oh, I should have erased it before it doesn't work. You're very strong faculty. No, they don't use the chalkboards. They used to have strong faculty. So, this is boring, but a liquid pneumatic is a different. The pneumatic is a totally different object because the pneumatic has that up down symmetry. So a three dimensional pneumatic has this funny situation. Right? I can draw the hemisphere, I could draw the whole sphere if I wanted to, but since the director and minus the director are the same, all the points down here are the same as the point up here. So what I do is I say, oh, I'm going to draw only the hemisphere because that's all the possible directions. And I'm just going to remind myself that this point. And this point, which are on diameters, are actually the same point. You can't actually draw this, which if I could draw it, it would be done, but I can't. Because it's all like twisted up. Because see, it's not like you just take a sphere and fold it on the line. Because this point and this point are related. Right? right? And this point and this point are related. I can't, if I pull this to here and this to here, it's all twisted up and across. It's very ugly. Okay, you can't draw it, but you can draw this representation. Everyone get it? This has a name. This is a cool thing. This is called RP2. All right, long before Star Wars. And the reason they called it this is R is real, and P, they say projected. But let me just say this: it's the set of planes. If I tell you what are all the two-dimensional planes, I can have the three dimensions, right? You know, this plane and this plane are the same plane. Yes. So all I care about is the set of planes, it's the set of planes, the set of two-dimensional planes. Okay. So now, I have this funky thing. When I go around my path here in the sample, uh -huh, I could, stupidly, have a path up here. And then, I could escape into the third dimension. But I could imagine a path that starts here and goes over the top, comes back down the bottom and ends here. These two points are really the same point. And now this, I can't escape. You might say, oh, why don't I just take these two points and bring them together? But I can't. As I move this one here, this one moves the other way. It's always running away. It's like this time we, we tied a balloon to my cat, right? And, and he, we didn't know he'd be afraid of it, but he's terrified, of course. It chased him, right? It took us a long time. You know, imagine, right? Or he didn't even, like, take. Like he came up, he got tape on him. I don't know. Oh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> so, it's an aside. All right? I'm trying to bring out that whole quantum mechanics thing. Talking about cats. So, here you have this thing going like so. So, what happens here? What this tells me is that pi 1 of RP2 is anybody? I can have this thing. This thing is nothing. This is zero. And then I can have this thing that goes around once. Can it go around twice? Why not? You shook your head. Now you're not looking at you, you, you shook your head. You shook your head. You knew the answer. Now you're looking down. Why? Why? Why can it not go around twice? Right, so, so suppose now I go from here to here. And then I do it again. Well, if I do it again, now, let me draw a better picture. Right, what I have, I have this. See, like I have a V that comes down, and I can lift this one up. I can turn that into a loop that just lifts right up. So, in fact, if I go around twice, I get back to nothing. So they call it Z2. It has two things. It has either yes or no. You can call it parity. Right now, it's more convenient to use multiplication. Right? Now you say that the group is the set of numbers 1 minus 1. 1 times 1 is 1. The 1 is the boring one, minus 1 is the interesting one, but 2 minus 1 is minus 1 squared is plus 1, it's also boring. Okay? So, final one of R2 is Z2. That means that if I have a two-dimensional system, 
that of pneumatics that can point in any direction actually can have point defects. And of course, I don't have to only do it in two dimensions. I can now <coughs> extend this to three dimensions. In three dimensions, what do I have? In three dimensions, instead of having a point defect, the point, which is living in this plane, extends to a line. So I actually have a defect line. And if I take any plane, cross plane perpendicular to it, I can then do my measuring loop like so, and measure it around the thing and get this charge. So there's now a line defect, like a vortex. Okay? So, oh good, I lost it. Everyone get it? So I have line defects. We're going to see, you're going to hear talks about that. The line defects are just point defects extended. It's as if I had extra symmetry perpendicular to it. It's like a vortex in a superfluid. It's like a vortex when you paddle a boat. All right, you paddle, has anyone paddled a boat? Has anyone seen a boat? <laughs> Press A if you've seen a boat. I'm doing my Tim Slocan imitation. Do I press it now? How about now? <laughs> How come this is question six? Okay, so, see, he did an earthquake quite talk. So, you have this line, so when you row a boat, there's a this vortex in the water, you can see it, right? That vortex, this is a vortex of liquid crystal where something's happening to the direction that you go around. It's changing by line. So, finally, let me finish by telling you about pi 2. Okay? And pi 2 is important because pi 2 is how it is that you have point defects. So now that we live in three dimensions, what do we have in three dimensions? We have line defects. We measure information about the line defects by using pi 1 of R D2, because this is the pneumatic. And we've decided that that's equal to V2, instead of two objects, the boring ones and the interesting ones. The two interesting ones are boring. So now we can ask ourselves, what if I have a point defect in three dimensions? Can I have anything? And the answer is sure. But now, instead of doing my measurement around a circle, I'm going to do my measurement around a sphere. You can think of it like calculating you know, the flux going through some Gaussian surface, but that's completely wrong. I mean, you can think of it that way. Lots of people do, but it's wrong. Okay? It's more complicated, it's more subtle. Because the Gauss thing doesn't give you the integers. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm now imagining here, here on each point on the sphere, I have an element of the sphere. So this is the map from the sphere to the sphere. Remember that unit sphere? The unit sphere, which was all the points, all the direction. So I map from the sphere to the sphere. Okay? This is the sphere that I'm measuring on. This is the sphere that it's going to. Right? Well, here's the cool thing. The first sphere, let me think of it as a bag, a closed bag. Okay? And the second sphere is, is just a sphere. Alright? So, one thing I can do is I can take this closed bag and I can just drop it. I can drape it on the sphere. You agree? And what happens, my friend, if I drape a bag over a sphere? Ah, if I drape a bag over a sphere, I can shrink that bag to a point. I can take the whole bag and squish it. The bag is infinitely squishable. I can squish it to the North Pole. Right? I didn't put the sphere in the bag. I put the bag on the sphere. Okay? So I take the bag, that's the first sphere, and I just drop it on the second sphere. But if I drop it on the second sphere, that's the point. I can shrink that to the point. That's the boring map. Too bad, maybe there are no other maps. But there are, because I could put this sphere inside the first bag. I can actually, right? I'm not going to cut the bag open and put the sphere in. That's not allowed. I'm going to have this sphere be born inside <laughs> the bag. Okay? I can also take the bag and I can have it go around the sphere twice. I can put it in two bags, right? I can put the sphere in three bags, four bags. And those bags, the inner bag, the bag one and bag two just have to be connected at a point. And then the whole thing is really one bag. Anyone get it? 
What I'm trying to say is, is that maps from the sphere to the sphere is there's the one where this whole sphere just goes to a point. That's the bag just laying over the top. Then there's the one where I put the sphere inside the bag. That's one. There's one sphere in one bag. And then I can take two bags. I can take the bag and pull out so the bag's on the outside. I have this big hunk of bag left. Right? It's stretchy too. And then I just put this, I take whatever, that hollow part and put it on the ins and put what's there on the inside also. So I can put this bag onto the sphere no times, one times, two times, three times. In fact, if I take this and instead of putting the bag over the, in the sphere inside the inside the bag, I can put the sphere on the outside of the bag. <coughs> what do I mean by that? I can use the I can turn the bag inside out. <coughs> now that's negative. That's like it going on a negative amount of times. Because if you take a, a right side in bag and an inside out bag and put them together, that'll be no bag. <laughs> Think about no. That would be a double. That would be that would be what you thought I was going to do. You take this single bag. And you pull it and you wrap it all the way around the sphere. So that now <clears throat> there's this ring on the top, right? But every part of it is a double layer of cloth or paper or whatever you want to make your bag, okay? And you can see one of them's inside out, one of them's right side in, one of them's inside out. And that, of course, is the same as not having a bag <coughs> around the sphere at all. Do you get it? Because you're going to have to ask him. <laughs> Come on, here's your bag. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I get I get how to uh, how the the, the 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 bag with the hole is is a point. Okay. Yeah, but look, but I look. Get how to wrap the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, look. Here, here's the bag. Okay. All right. Here's the bag. And imagine that the bag, I there. It's the inside of the cloth, which I can't show you because it's on the inside. And I take my sphere and I put it here and I just wrap it up and I, you know, try to put it all together so now I have this, right? So what's happened, right? The inside of the bag is between the front and the back right. of this piece of cloth. So when I've done this, one side of the bag goes around outside it. One, the bag goes around the sphere one time, this side, uh -huh. right side out, and then on the inside it goes around it, outside in. And that, of course, I can drop off the bag. Does that make sense? You think about it. He's getting nervous. I have to do that. <laughs> so, it turns out, and, I, and it's, uh, by the way, this has been invented for a thousand years. No, really a hundred years, okay? But it's very last millennium, right? That this is called pi 2 of s2, maps from the sphere to the sphere, and they are characterized by, it turns out, the integers also. And I can go around once, twice, three times, four times. And that is the charge of the topological defects, the point defects, the hedgehogs, hyperbolic and radial, and all those kind of things. So the lesson here is, and again, I'll remind you while I'm ending, that the cool thing is, under dynamics, which is smooth, under smooth dynamics, these numbers don't change. So these things are long-lived until you do something terrible to it. And the nice thing is, which Misha will tell you about, is that there's a beautiful thing. So the matics, what can the matics have? The matics can have point defects, which some people call hedgehogs. And they can have line defects, too. And of course, the truly beautiful thing is that the line defects and the point defects talk to each other. And that's what I'm going to tell you about. So I encourage you to ask him questions. Right? He'll be here all week. Right? He knows. But there's plenty of books on this, and uh, I'll entertain any questions. Thank you. It's getting late. So I'm sorry, we're going to have our next speaker. No questions? No. I have questions.